Effects that return cards to the hand from the field, graveyard, or even the banished zone are often referred to as bounce effects. Bouncing works both ways, as many cards can bounce both your opponent's cards and your own. Today we're rating the top 10 bounce effects for returning your opponent's cards to the hand, since that's very different from cards that can return other cards to your own hand. So you might want to keep an eye out for those kinds of cards in the near future. Anyways, let's get started. Here to solve at number 10, we have Compulsory Evacuation Device. This is a normal trap card that simply states you can target one monster from the field and return it to its owner's hand. Compulsory Evacuation Device isn't the first card to bounce cards. That would be Hain Hain. But Compulse is perhaps the most iconic example of a bounce effect and has seen the longest amount of competitive play of every bounce card. Technically, Compulse can be used to return your own monsters to your hand, and that utility is part of what makes it good. But since it's a trap card, it's usually only included decks for the purpose of bouncing your opponent's monsters. Compulsory Evacuation Device, often shortened to Compulse, is one of the oldest staple removal traps in the game. Back in the early years of Yu-Gi-Oh, bouncing wasn't considered quite as good as cards that destroy your opponent's monsters, like Sakuretsu Armor or Bottomless Trap Hole, as bouncing a main deck monster back to your opponent's hand is technically a minus one in card advantage compared to those other cards. Still, it would see some play as it could be chained at any point so long as there was a monster on the field, letting it dodge cards like Mystical Space Typhoon or Heavy Storm, unlike more conditional removal traps. This would allow it to go at least card neutral while gaining a bit of tempo on your opponent. Compulse would continue to age much better than hard removal traps though, once the extra deck started to become more prominent. Bouncing a monster summoned from the extra deck isn't a net minus in card advantage, since the monster would go back to the extra deck instead of the hand. Also, the fact that Compulse doesn't destroy cards gave it a huge boost in relevance as soon as the 5Ds era rolled around and Stardust Dragon became a staple of the metagame. Stardust's effect to negate destruction effects and pop in and out of the field made it immune to powerful cards like Torrential Tribute. Whereas Compulse could wait until your opponent committed the resources in making it, bounce it back, and usually net you card advantage instead of lose it because of the investment of going into an extra deck monster. As more years pass, you would continually see meta dominating extra deck monsters with stronger protection or recursion effects like El Shadow Alwinda or Destiny Hero Destroyer Phoenix Enforcer, which Compulse could answer well. The only thing that has really limited its continued usage in these situations is some boss monsters being immune to trap cards or targeting effects, like the iconic Aplaco Fort Towers, or a modern threat like Boroland Dragon but Compulse still has immense value against those decks for bouncing cards mid-combo to prevent the summoning of those monsters in the first place. Compulsory Evacuation Device has seen persistent play at all levels of competitive play ever since it was printed in 2004, even earning itself time on the limited list for nearly five years. Any deck that has some kind of back row for disruption is likely to consider it as an option because of just how useful bouncing a monster can be. To this day, it still sees play in rogue strategies like Labyrinth, when it comes to bounce effects, the Compulsory Evacuation Device sets the bar for all other cards. Riding in at number 9, we have Dragoback the Rideable Dragon. This is an equip spell card that states you can only equip it to a monster you control, and you can only control one Dragoback the Rideable Dragon. While it's equipped to a non-effect monster, you can target one card your opponent controls and return it to the hand. Also, when it's sent to the graveyard, you can equip it from your graveyard to an adventure token you control. Both of these effects are hard once per turns. Dragoback is a core part of the adventure engine. While it would be considered terrible as a standalone card, the fact you can incidentally search it off the effect of Fateful Adventure after you've already set things up with the Rite of Iron Masir means the card is often just a free plus one for including it in an already powerful setup. Adventure naturally creates a powerful interaction by getting Wandering Griffin Rider into play, but that's generally meant for turn one. Dragoback gives Adventure the ability to threaten established boards on turn two and later with its bounce effect. This was used as a generic way to give decks that could run Adventure an easy access to powerful floodgates before committing to further plays. Decks like Prank Kids would come to rely on these effects to shore up its consistent but low ceiling power level and became tier 1 threats. Though Dragoback's usage as a bounce card wasn't everything. The fact that Fateful Adventure itself has the effect to prevent a monster equipped with an equip card from being destroyed by battle once a turn made dealing with the otherwise inimposing adventure token a hassle. And its effect to equipment sent to the graveyard allowed for pile style adventure decks to also run a highly effective draw engine with copies of Magician Souls and its searcher Illusion of Chaos. Magician Soul's ability to summon itself and draw up to two cards by sending spells and traps to the graveyard lets you turn an in-hand or even on-field Dragoback into a real cards from the deck, as well as an overall plus as Dragoback would just pop back onto the field after being sent. Even without Souls, Adventure decks would fulfill Fateful Adventure's mandatory discard from one of its searches to discard Dragoback and lose nothing in the process. The Adventure engine is one of the most powerful and generic engines in Yu-Gi-Oh's history, and that's in no small part to the large utility Dracoback the Rideable Dragon provides as a bounce spell and card advantage enabler. Dropping in at number 8, we have Alpha the Master of Beasts. This is a level 8 Earth Beast monster with 3000 attack and 2500 defense. It cannot be normal summoned or set and must be special summoned from your hand while the total attack of all monsters upon controls is more than that of all the monsters you control. You can target any number of Beast, Beast Warrior, or Winged Beast monsters you control, return them to your hand, and then return face-up monsters your opponent controls to the hand equal number of cards you return. For the rest of the turn, after the effect is used, Alpha the Master Beast cannot attack directly. 
Alpha the Master Beast is one of the most powerful standalone main deck monsters of all time. It has a summon condition similar to Dino Wrestler Pankertops, where it can special summon itself for free so long as your opponent has a greater board presence than you. And similar to Pankertops, Alpha has an incredibly powerful board breaking effect. While the ability to bounce multiples of your own monsters doesn't frequently come up, since Alpha itself is a beast, you can always bounce it, bounce one of your opponent's monsters, and just summon Alpha again since there's no restriction on its summoning condition, just its bouncing effect. For all the reasons compulsory evacuation devices is often better than other traps that can destroy monsters, Alpha is often a stronger board breaking monster than Pinkertops against certain threats. The biggest difference between it and its competition in Pinkertops is Pinkertops does have the benefits of its removal being quick effect. Still, Alpha serves a similar purpose in that it can remove a threat of the board and still be used to attack over other threats with its absurdly high 3000 attack. Alpha is a relatively new monster, released in late 2020 so it hasn't seen as much potential play. It isn't used much as a main deck monster because it rarely helps any decks with consistency, as its effect and summon conditions are usually only good going second when most decks want to go first. But ever since its release, it has been a mainstay in side decks. Even seen play in topping decks from the past year during the tier limits format, as its bounce effect let it remove tier monsters without triggering their effects when sent to the graveyard, as well as its 3000 attack threatening major end board monsters like Predaplant Dragostepalia with its 2700 attack, when a card like Pankertops couldn't with its only 2600 attack. Alpha the Master Beast is an incredibly powerful card that will likely see sideboard play so long as Yu-Gi-Oh revolves around setting up powerful boards. Next up at number 7, we have Ancient Warrior's Oath, Double Dragon Lords. This is a Link 2 Beast Warrior Wind monster with 1100 attack, whose materials include two Beast Warrior monsters, including a Wind Ancient Warriors monster. Its effects are that all Ancient Warrior monsters you control gain 500 attack and defense. You can also add one Ancient Warriors card from your deck to your hand, so long as Double Dragon Lords was Link Summon. Also, you can send one card from your hand or field to the graveyard to then target one face-up card your opponent controls and return it to the hand. Both of these effects are hard ones per turns. Ancient Warriors Oath Double Dragon Lords is quite a powerful monster for Link too. You might imagine that the ability to immediately add a card from its archetype to your hand on top of a bounce effect might find it a home in Ancient Warriors. And while it is one of the archetype's best monsters, Double Dragon Lords really shined in Tri-Brigade. All of the main deck Tri-Brigade monsters, like Tri-Brigade Kid or Tri-Brigade Fractal, could use their on-field effects to banish Beast, Beast Warrior, or Wing Beast monsters from your graveyard to cheat out a Link monster of a monster with one of those Tri-types. And since Double Dragon Lords is a Beast Warrior, Tri-Brigades could ignore its summoning conditions and just cheat onto the field at the low cost of banishing two monsters from the graveyard. Something Tri-Brigade was able to easily set up with cards like Fractal and Kid dumping multiple monsters to the graveyard with their effects. Not only that, but its requirement to send a card from hand or field to the graveyard to bounce an opponent's monster was often an easy way to trigger the effect of Tri-Brigade Nerval, either by sending it or a copy of Kit, and would let the deck refill its graveyard for future Link Summons while adding more Tri-Brigade monsters to the hand to create those Link Summons. It could even send a previously used Fire Formation 10 key that was left on the field, and because of this, often its cost to use as bounce effects either hardly had a cost at all, or actually gained advantage in aggregate. Double Dragon Lords is not a game warpingly powerful monster, but it was one of the best end board monsters in a modern archetype that hit tier 1 status across multiple formats and variations of Tri-Brigade, even if Ancient Warriors themselves weren't often seen taking advantage of it like Tri-Brigade did. Following that, at number 6, we have Tenyi Spirit Vishuda. This is a level 7 Dark Worm monster with 1500 attack and 2500 defense. It states that if you control no monsters, you can spell some of this card from your hand. Also, if you control a face-up non-effect monster, you can banish Vishuda from your hand or graveyard, then target one card your opponent controls and return it to the hand. Both of these effects are hard once per turns. Tenyi Spirit Vishuda is one of the most powerful monsters in the Tenyi archetype, which earned it a place in two different modern tier 1 decks, Sword Soul Tenyi and Halki Fibrax Synchro Tenyi combo decks. Its ability to summon itself for free, link off into a Monk of the Tenyi, and immediately use its graveyard effect to bounce a card, gave any deck that could run Vishuda into an instant out to all sorts of floodgates. Most notoriously, cards like Imperial Order and Skill Drain, which were often hard to deal with as the cards that could remove them were frequently negated by their floodgate effects. But Vishuda could activate in the graveyard in hand, letting it dodge a card like Skill Drain's oppressive effect. Vishuda also worked as an incredible board breaker against most decks, as it was in metagames rife with cards like Sword Soul Supreme Sovereign Changing and Destiny Hero Destroyer Phoenix Enforcer, who were very awkward or impossible to deal with using typical destruction effects. Its ability to work from the graveyard as well as being a worm monster also made it a perfect card to discard for a card like Sword Soul Strategist Long Yon, who would summon a non-effect token to immediately turn on Vishuda's effect in instances where you already had monsters on the board and couldn't special summon. It was searchable multiple different ways as well, as Tenyi Spirit Ashuna, Heavenly Dragon Circle, and sometimes even Sword Soul Emergence could all get access to it. Highly searchable, easily summonable, and incredibly powerful removal effect made Tenyi Spirit Vishuda a defining card of the 2020 and 2020 metagames and one of the best bounce cards ever. Flying in at number 5, we have Lurless and Sem Blue Robin. This is a rank 1 Wind Winged Beast Xyz monster with 0 attack and 0 defense. Its Xyz materials are 2 plus level 1 monsters. 
It gains 500 attack for each material attached to it. Its effects state that if your opponent special summons a monster or monsters, you can detach one material, then target one of those special summon monsters and return it to the hand. Also, if this card in your possession is sent to your graveyard by an opponent's card, you can target one other Lyrless monster in your graveyard and add it to your hand. Lyrless in Sen Blue Robin is an incredibly powerful end board monster, featured, as you might expect, in Lyrless decks. Though, any deck with level 1 monsters in abundance like Drytron could reasonably summon it with its generic materials. It's somewhat similar to the previously mentioned Double Dragon Lords, as it was a low investment end board monster that can disrupt your opponent's plays by bouncing them. While Double Dragon Lords could bounce any one target, what makes Ensemble Robin even more powerful is that its effect is not a hard once per turn, or even a once per turn. And Lyrilis decks could very easily put more than two materials on it by just summoning out a lot of monsters, or using the effect of a monster like Lyrilis Sapphire Swallow to attach more materials from the graveyard on summon. This made it so Ensemble Robin could frequently bounce three or four special summons back to the hand if you had no way to deal with Robin before special summoning. And since many monsters have a cost or limitation on how many times they can special summon, you could frequently end an opponent's turn with just one Ensemble Robin constantly bouncing your opponent's plates. If that wasn't enough, even if your opponent did have an answer for it, if they ended up sending it to the graveyard, and Sin Blue Robin's effect of float into another Lyrilisk in hand instantly sets you up for the following turn to make more plays. Thanks to cards like Lyrilisk Barrel Canary, which is able to special summon itself and one other Lyrilisk in your graveyard that you had attached to Sin Blue Robin to immediately combo off again. Modern tier 1 decks like Pure Lyrilisk and Lyrilisk Tri Brigade owe their success in no small part to how powerful Lyrilisk and Sin Blue Robin is. Coming to number 4, we have Heraptic Seals of the Heavenly Spheres. This is a Link 2 Dragon Light Monster with zero attack that requires two Dragon Monsters as its materials. It states that once per turn, if this card is in the extra monster zone, as a quick effect you can tribute one monster from your hand or field, return one face-up card in the field to the hand. Also, if this card is tributed, you can special summon one dragon monster from your hand or deck and make the summon monster's attack and defend zero, with this effect also being a once per turn. Heavenly Spheres is one of the most versatile Link monsters in history. It primarily served as a core piece of the Dragon Link deck, a deck that uses a variety of mini powerful dragons printed throughout Yu-Gi-Oh's long history to create boards of powerful boss monsters like Borolet Dragon, Borolet Savage Dragon, and Heratic Seals of the Heavenly Spheres itself. This is another monster similar to Double Dragon Lords and Lurless and Blue Robin, in that it only requires two materials to get a monster in the field that can threaten your opponent's plays with its quick effect bounce ability. Heavenly Spheres takes it up a notch with its secondary effect though, as you attribute it to special summon a dragon from the deck. Not only that, you could use it to go into other plays that can disrupt your opponents, like Fallen of Albas who could fuse away your opponent's monsters when summoned to the field. Heraptic Seals of the Heavenly Spheres is often compared to cards like Predaplant and Vertiantaconda for being a play you can default into when all your other plays have been interrupted by hand traps, but you still have some leftover monsters to link off into a real play. The phrase, Spheres Pass, while often a joke meant to mock Dragon Link, is really just a statement of how resilient the deck can be at putting out relevant threats with limited materials. Dragon Link has been a constant meta threat for years, dating back to 2019 in the deck's infancy when Heretic Seals of the Heavenly Spheres was printed. Spheres is an iconic card in an equally iconic and durable deck, making it one of the best bounce cards of all time. And at number 3, we have an Emancipator Risen, Dragite. This is a level 8 water rock synchro monster with 3000 attack, 2200 defense, which requires one tuner plus one or more non-tuner monsters for its materials. It states that during your main phase, you can excavate the top 5 cards of your deck, and if you do, you can return cards to your opponent controls to the hand, up to the number of rock monsters excavated, then place all the excavated cards in the bottom of your deck in any order. Also, once per turn, when your opponent activates a spell or trap card or a fact while you have a water monster in your graveyard, you can negate the activation, and if you do, destroy that card. Dragite is the boss monster of its namesake deck, at Emancipator. This was a top tier rock based combo archetype that swarmed the field with free special summons thanks to the effects of cards like at Emancipator Researcher, at Emancipator Seeker, and at Emancipator Analyzer. These monsters were able to excavate, which just means reveal cards from the top of the deck, and summon a rock monster that was excavated. Since these monsters were all tuners, they would immediately go into powerful synchro plays like Dragite, or use the high amount of summons to go into similarly powerful link monsters like Kriston Hockey Fibrax, who notably is also a water monster. Which means any deck with access to Kriston Hockey Fibrax could, and often did, include Dragite as an endboard monster for its negation effect after putting Hockey Fibrax into the graveyard to fulfill its water condition. What made Dragite especially good in Ad Emancipator, though, was its first effect. Since Ad Emancipator decks were fueled with rock monsters to enable their plays, a resolved Dragite going second could often excavate three or four rock monsters making its effect less of a bounce effect and more as a total board wipe when going second. One Dragite effect can be more devastating than playing both Raigeki and Harpy's Feather Duster combined, given how much better bounce it can be compared to destruction effects. Like previous entries in this list, Dragite's incredibly powerful as both an end board monster and a going second tool, but unlike, say, Heratic Seals of Heavenly Spheres, it also supports a powerful 3000 attack body, making it a very useful monster to beat over your opponent's monsters, or in the case of An Emancipator, a good option to pair with Axis Code Talker and easily one turn kill an opponent after wiping their field. Its utility as an end board, board clearing, and high attack threat earns Dragite the number 3 spot on this list. 
And at number 2 on this list, we have Magis Spectre Unicorn Kirin. This is a level 6 wind spellcaster pendulum monster with a scale of 2. It has no pendulum effect, but its monster effect is that during either player's turn, you can target one pendulum monster in your monster zone and one monster your opponent controls and return both targets to the hand. And this effect is a hard once per turn. Also, Kirin cannot be targeted or destroyed by your opponent's card effects. Magic Spectre Unicorn Kirin is one of the most dominant pendulum monsters of all time. Its inherent protection effect makes dealing with it outside of battle phase incredibly awkward. Normally, its 6 star stat line would make it unplayable, but with the nature of pendulum strategies, it's usually easy to get a scale above 7 to easily pendulum summon Kirin into the field. Even if your opponent does have an answer for it, Kirin can often dodge that answer by just bouncing itself as well as a monster your opponent controls to the hand, setting up for the next turn. Then you just pendulum summon him again, creating a recursive, resilient disruption loop. No matter what pendulum monster of your own you bounce to fulfill Kirin's effect, it usually just served to reload your hand for other pendulum summons instead of acting as a real downside. Playing against Kirin before it was banned was a similar experience to playing against Destiny Hero Destroyer Phoenix Enforcer in modern formats, with its combination recursion as a pendulum monster and its constant disruption effect. A big part of what made Kirin so powerful was that it was also a generic spellcaster pendulum monster that puts no restrictions on what pendulum decks could use it. Cards like Wavering Eyes, the in archetype Magic Spectre Raccoon Bunbuku, and Magical Abductor could easily search it out to gain access to this powerful monster. For over a year after Kirin's release, it would be included in basically every single pendulum strategy imaginable, like Perfora Pals, Pendulum Magicians, Metal Foes, and its native Magic Spectres. This ubiquity would get it limited to one, but that wasn't the end. It wasn't until the Tier 0 Zodiac format where Kirin finally performed its last bounce, as one of the many variants of the Zodiac format was Zodiac Metal Foes, a deck that would still run copies of Bunbuku to search Kirin and gain access to its recursive threat to pair with the already powerful Zodiac and Metal Foes archetypes. This was enough for Konami, who would ban this menacing unicorn once and for all in March of 2017, a good, if short, run for one of the best pendulum monsters and best bounce cards of all time. And finally, at number 1 on this list, we have Kelbeck the Ancient Vanguard. This is a level 4 earth fairy monster with 1500 attack and 1800 defense. Its first effect states that if a card is sent from the hand or deck to your opponent's graveyard, you can target one special summon monster your opponent controls, special summon Kelbeck from your hand, then return that monster to the hand. Its second effect is that if it's sent from the hand or deck to the graveyard, you can choose to make each player send the top 5 cards of their deck to the graveyard. Then, if Exchange Spirits is in your graveyard, you can set one trap from your graveyard to the field. Both of these effects are once per turn. Kelbeck is one of the four Ishizu monster retrains alongside Keldo the Sacred Protector, Mudora the Sword Oracle, and Agido the Ancient Sentinel. This series of Earth Fairy monsters all revolve around milling massive amounts of cards from the decks of the graveyard, disrupting the graveyards, and special summoning themselves. This pseudo-archetype found its way into being the second half of a deck alongside tier limits to create arguably the most powerful tier 0 strategy of all time. Kelbeck specifically is one of the milling Ishizu monsters alongside Agito, but whereas some players would cut down on copies of Agito, Kelbeck was usually played at 3 copies in these decks primarily because it both serves as a powerful way to mill your own cards to set up your tier limit plays, but also as a good hand trap. Most hand traps have some sort of triggering condition, like how Ash Blossom and Joy Spring needs a card to interact with the deck in some way to work. Kelbeck's condition being when a card is sent from the hand or deck to the graveyard means it's constantly live against other Ishizu and tier limit decks. On top of that, on your own turn in Ishizu tier limit decks, you are likely to trigger the mill effects of Kelbeck or Agito, which will then in turn mill your opponent's deck and suddenly trigger Kelbeck to spell summon itself and clear a monster off your opponent's board. The fact that Kelbeck bounces means it's especially good against opposing tier limit players, as most tier limit monsters have some effect when destroyed and sent to the graveyard. Destroying an opponent's tier limits Kit Kalos usually isn't any kind of inconvenience to them, but returning it to the extra deck was incredibly disruptive. Even outside of this strictly one deck format, Kelbeck's ability to work when a card is sent to the graveyard would be powerful anyhow. The vast majority of powerful modern strategies have cards that replicate foolish burial style effects for Kelbeck to jump at. Recent, other metagame relevant decks like Sprite will use Sprite Spray and just set up their Sprite Elf, or Mathmech will use Mathmech Circular to spell summon itself by sending a card to the graveyard. Kelbeck as a standalone hand trap would be powerful but being both a powerful hand trap and part of the most powerful deck of all time secures it to spawn at the top of this list. Alright, and that's the list. Are there any other cards that bounce cards like these that you think should be on this list, or do you have any ideas for future topics just like this one? If so, please leave suggestions down below in the comments.